And we are now recording. And I'm gonna go back to my slideshow here, maybe. All right, so welcome tonight to the history of the Kentucky Rifle, brought to you by the Nevada Department of Wildlife, hosted by gun expert and hunter ed instructor, Kingston Wolf. I believe 24 years as a hunter ed instructor, if I have the numbers right off the top of my head. And tonight I'm gonna to be your moderator. My name is Don Anderson and I'm the hunter and archery education coordinator. So thank you for joining the Nevada Department of Wildlife for a conservation education program. This is a, a family friendly program and it's rated PG. Profanity and inappropriate behaviors will not be tolerated in the chat or Q&A. All questions in the chat box or Q&A should be on topic and failing to do so will result in being muted in the chat or Q&A or being completely removed from the live stream. So a brief loose agenda, we have our welcome. Um, so welcome, Mr. Kingston Wolf. We're going to do the history of the Kentucky rifle this evening. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box and I'll answer them or if I can answer them. If not, then I'll direct them to, uh, to Kingston when we have time. And then following the webinar, you'll receive a link to the survey. We encourage you to fill these surveys out. Give us your feedback and let us know what you'd like to see more of or if there's topics that you'd like us to cover, let us know. Otherwise, I'm going to stop share screening and I'm going to let Kingston have the floor. So it's all yours, Kingston. Okay, thank you, Dawn. Uh, I, first of all, I want to give you a compliment. You put together that beautiful cover on this uh, uh, Zoom class tonight and uh, you couldn't have done better because what you picked was a contract gun uh, made by Lehman uh, for the federal government. It's a relatively short barreled gun. Uh, flintlock ignition and uh, a fairly thin and curved butt plate. And that is the exact model gun that Lewis and Clark took west with them in 1803. So you're right on the money with that stuff. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about Kentucky rifles. And uh, basically, this is something that I have studied my entire adult life because it has captivated my attention. And uh, I call them Kentucky rifles. Some people call them Pennsylvania rifles. And some people call them long rifles. And uh, <clears throat> you have to say, well, which one is correct? Actually, all three names are correct. And, uh, but historically, the, most of the guns were made in the state of Pennsylvania. Now, if you can picture this, uh, between 1850 and, I'm sorry, let me start over. Between 1750 and 1850, there was between 2,000 and 3,000 gunsmiths in the state of Pennsylvania alone. Now think about that. If you were to live in Pennsylvania today and you had between 2,000 and 300, 2,000 and 3,000 gunsmiths, that's still a lot of people building guns. And uh, that was followed by the state of Kentucky that had somewhere, I can account for about 1,500 gunsmiths. So that means there's probably at least another 500 more that are unaccounted for so they had 2,000 gunsmiths. So that tells me every township, every village, every county, every holler had themselves a gunsmith. So um, <clears throat> if you use any one of those uh, three names of Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Long Rifle, you'd be correct. If you, if you come from Pennsylvania, I'm pretty sure you're gonna call it a Pennsylvania rifle. If you're from Kentucky, I'm pretty sure you're gonna call it a Kentucky rifle. And if you're from Virginia, I'm pretty sure you're gonna call it a long rifle. Now this, this there gets, it gets confusing because uh, once upon a time in the year of 1815, uh, we were doing battle with the British in the war of 1812 and the state of Kentucky asked for volunteers to fight the British in New Orleans. And uh, these volunteers went to fight the British and uh, they made a name for themselves. There was a, volunteer by the name of Audrey Aud, who was brazen enough to stand up on a cotton bale. And this cotton bale would sit about five feet tall. He would jump on that cotton bale and face off with the British. The British were wearing their beautiful red uniforms and shoot, shot brown best rifles. 
And at 400 yards, he was quite confident that he was out of range of uh, British musketry. And uh, he was brazen enough that he knew he couldn't be shot. And what he was looking for was British officers uh, with the red, uh, or I'm sorry, the gold hash marks on their uniforms. And he would tilt his hat back and he would take out a British officer. And he did this time and time and time again. And uh, this has been put to poems. It has been put to songs. It's got almost to mythological proportions. Uh, Johnny Horton even made a song about it in uh, the 1960s called The Battle of New Orleans. And you can Google that later on YouTube. It's still out there. So that's where the confusion comes. But there are a number of states that built these rifles. First and foremost, it was Pennsylvania, followed by Maryland, the state of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, some guns out of Illinois, a few guns out of New York, and a few guns out of Tennessee, and a few guns out of Rhode Island. So uh, that's, that's the majority of the uh, uh, original 13 colonies that were building firearms. So now, one thing you have to understand that uh, this is before the United States was the United States. Uh, th these, this would be known as the Americas, and it's just an extremely hostile uh, environment. Now, most of these guns are not signed, which makes them very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to identify 200 years after the fact. And uh, some guns were signed, and uh, the theory goes that they didn't sign their guns because they were afraid of British retaliation during the Revolutionary War. Uh, that hypothesis doesn't hold water because there was a gunsmith by the name of uh, Jacob Deckert who built guns, are you ready for this? For the state of, of the state of Pennsylvania Committee of Safety, he built muskets for the, de the Department of Safety to supply arms for the state militia. Now that sounds counter to anything that you might recognize today. Um, he was such a prolific uh, gunsmith. Uh, my wife and I were in uh, Windsor Castle a few years back and I recognized the Kentucky rifle on the top of the wall in Windsor Castle. So I went over to the key and I read that the gun that was there was a Kentucky rifle made by Jacob Decker. And what happened was, is uh, they took that off of a Patriot, a fallen Patriot, and it made its way to uh, King George in England. He wanted to see what this secret weapon was that the Americans had. And uh, he was, uh, he, they never found him per and persecuted him. Uh, but most of these guns, again, are not signed, and it's typically uh, what I call a Puritan pride. These people were very religious people, and they didn't sign their guns be because they thought it was uh, improper to uh, brag to God about your crafts and skills. And uh, you didn't need to do that because God already knew how, how crafty you were. So, uh, again, many of these guns aren't signed. Sometimes they are signed with initials only. and uh, there are quite a bit of fun to, to, to try to track down. And another reason why these guns aren't sighted is because these were tools. Uh, basically, like you and I would look at a hammer or a screwdriver or a wrench. Um, when you break them and you use them up, you throw them away and you start over. And I think that's, uh, that's what happened here. These, a lot of these guns uh, were consumed because they were used every day. Uh, I don't think they intended to be looked at 200 years later. All right. Um, so what were these guns used for? Um, again, you have to understand that uh, we are our colony to Great Britain. We don't have any finished products uh, to deliver. Uh, basically, we sent raw materials to Great Britain. And what we got back from, uh, from Europe was finished goods. And because they sailed halfway across the world, uh, they were hugely expensive. So uh, basically, uh, being a colony to uh, Great Britain had its huge disadvantages. It was extremely expensive to acquire ready-made goods, and we didn't have a lot of industry here in the country. Okay, um, and there's, uh, I'll, I'll talk about several of these gunsmiths here in a few minutes. Um, so what were these guns used for? Um, well, you heard me speak of them being used uh, as uh, a military weapon against the British, and um, they're also hunting guns. Uh, you hunted your dinner with, uh, with these guns. 
Now, all of the guns that I will show you this evening, almost without exception, they are all small caliber guns, 40 caliber or less. Now, if you're a smokeless shooter, 40 caliber is going to sound pretty big, but basically what 40 caliber looks like in a muzzle loader is you were to unload a, a bag of frozen peas, green peas, uh, the biggest green pea there would be 40 caliber. So that's a very small, very small uh, uh, projectile. And what we had as a colony, because we had in, in, to import our lead and import our gunpowder, uh, it was hugely expensive and we had to be very efficient on the use of both. Uh, we later made our own gunpowder here because of the Revolutionary War. The British cut us off from uh, considerably uh, supplies for gun locks, guns, gun locks, gunpowder, and, and of course lead and that kind of thing. We had to make that here uh, in the States. So Hollywood does a pretty good job of sending us movies where you see this tall, lanky fellow with his coonskin hat and this rifle that's almost as long as he is. And he, take it, he takes it with him everywhere he went. And I think for the most part, I think that might be true. I, I think these guys, uh, uh, they took their guns with them uh, because if you lived uh, out in the wilderness, uh, you could be attacked by uh, an Indian war party. party. Uh, you needed your gun when you fought the British, and you also needed your gun to hunt for your dinner. And uh, here again, it's another one of these kind of things where uh, it, you, there was no such thing as a hunting license. There was no such thing as hunting regulations. Basically, if you had a loaded gun in an empty stomach, uh, you went hunting. And if you missed your dinner um, and you went hungry for one night, I think that would be lesson learned. You're not going to make that mistake again. So that's how I think that went. You know, uh, <clears throat> okay, so, so now who were these people that made these guns? Um, a lot of these uh, people were European immigrants to the United States. Um, I would hear the term uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, built these guns, and I've never understood why that the Pennsylvania Dutch had these very elaborate uh, circular geometrics painted on their barns, on their houses, on their furniture, but it never shows up on their guns. And the reason is they weren't Pennsylvania Dutch at all. They were Pennsylvania Deutsch. Now Deutsch is German for German. It means German. And uh, a lot of these people that came from Europe uh, were here seeking religious freedom. Now that might not hold a lot of water today, but it had a huge impact if you lived in Europe. Um, if you were if you were known as a, a Huguenot, you were persecuted in Europe, and a Huguenot is a Protestant. Uh, so basically, you had uh, Presbyterians, you had Lutherans, you had Moravians, uh, and uh, you had an, a, about a dozen other religions that you wouldn't even know about today. But if you were to travel through a graveyard uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, these graveyards that are one in two hundred years old. Well, these gravestones are marked with the religion of the people that had passed. And there's a dozen religions there that I've never even heard of before. And uh, my take on it is this. If, uh, if you weren't uh, uh, aligning yourself with the Pope, uh, you were considered a Huguenot. And uh, they persecuted Huguenots. The Pope even struck a coin because he murdered Huguenots in the 1500s. Um, you had the, the Jacob Ferry family that left He's French, and he left France for Germany uh, to meet up with another uh, German family there where they would travel to the Americas uh, in pursuit of religious freedom. Now, you have to understand that if you didn't think like I thought, if you were a Protestant, uh, and if you, throw, uh, you showed no allegiance to the Pope and you showed no allegiance to the king, I'm sure you were unemployable. And uh, there was no pros prospect of prosperity or owning land. So I think that is the draw to the Americas. Uh, you have people that uh, were looking for freedom of thought, freedom of choice, freedom of uh, religion, and uh, the possibility of owning land. So there's a huge draw to the Americas. And it's a hugely dangerous place. Um, <clears throat> okay, I, I think I've got that message clear. So let's talk about some of these gunsmiths here. Um, these people, uh, you understand what freedom is here. When you, when you have people that are uh, free spirit enough to leave whatever comforts they have from Europe 
and travel to an unknown continent, that takes great courage. And uh, with that uh, freedom of thought comes freedom of speech. And with uh, freedom of speech and freedom of thought, you have creativity to explore and create. And that's what, uh, that's what these guns are all about. The, the craftsmanship that goes into me is, is unbelievable. Uh, to build a Kentucky rifle, you'd have to be a blacksmith. Uh, you'd have to be a welder. You'd have to be a millwright. You'd have to be a machinist to bore the, the barrel and to uh, rifle the barrel. You'd have to be a carpenter to stock it. Um, you'd have to uh, know how to work a foundry to uh, cast your own brass. Uh, you'd need to be a locksmith. Um, and you, in, in some cases, you'd need to be a silversmith because you've added decoration to your gun. And uh, before we're done here, many of these gunsmiths were actually silversmiths and watch repairmen as well. So there's a lot of crafts that have to come together to make a Kentucky rifle. Now, uh, the average height of a working man in the Americas in 1800 is five foot eight. So you have to ask yourself why you would build a rifle that has a 42 to 44 inch barrel on it, because now you stand your gun up next to you, your gun is taller than you are. And if you're from Kentucky, those rifles are four to six inches longer still. So now you've got a 48 inch barrel on a gun and this gun is taller than you are. So, and you would drag this gun through the, uh, the dense undergrowth of let's say Kentucky. Now I have stood on the Cumberland Gap Trail and it's roughly this wide, it's four feet wide. And past that you're in uh, uh, undergrowth and uh, carrying a long rifle like that would be hugely cumbersome. And the reason why these guns are that long is because we had to make our own gunpowder here in the Americas. Um, I'm gonna give you everything short of the complete formula to build it uh, this evening. Uh, to build gunpowder, it's made out of potassium nitrate, sulfur, and charcoal, pretty basic stuff. And uh, if you travel through Kentucky, uh, Kentucky is riddled with caves and when you have caves you have bats and then you find bat guano and they would leach uh, the potassium nitrate out of the bat guano mix that with uh, powdered sulfur and you grind up uh, some charcoal from your fire and you grind up that charcoal into a powder you make a slurry paste out of it and then you redry it and flake it you now have gunpowder now I highly recommend you not do that uh, in your in your oven tonight okay uh, unless you intend to level your house and your neighbor's house too so don't don't consider doing that thank now, you for that word of uh, advice. there's a couple, what's that the, what's that <laughs> thank you for those words of advice with that little disclaimer i appreciate that yeah, yeah don't don't <laughs> even consider don't even consider doing it i mean I've, I've i've known the exact formula for a good number of years um, but I haven't the courage to build it because uh, you, you don't know uh, the, how explosive this stuff is. Uh, even today, the places that are building gunpowder, black powder specifically, are buildings that are put together, but they're not nailed together because it's a matter of matter of, uh, if, it's a matter of when they have a mishap. And all it takes is an electrostatic spark for it to go up. So when I reload this stuff here at home, I take all my smokeless powder tools and I put them away and I hide them. They're not even on my bench because I were, if I were to grab a plastic funnel for my uh, modern reloading, that's enough to set off an electrostatic charge to, to set off my gunpowder. So that's how delicate that stuff is. And so when I, when, I, when I reload black powder metallic cartridge or anything else that's black powder related, everything else has to go away. So there's never that confusion. That's how dangerous it is. Okay. Um, there are several gunsmiths I, I'd like to talk about tonight. And uh, one of them is, I mentioned Dac Jacob Deckard here a, a few minutes ago. And uh, like I said, he's probably the most prolific and signed uh, gunsmith of, of the period. And uh, I mentioned Jacob Ferry. Uh, he's a Frenchman that came to the United States. He's a Lancaster gunsmith as well. Uh, he basically had five generations of either gunsmiths or powder makers in Pennsylvania. And there's another fellow by the name of uh, Melcher Fordney. Um, 
I would love to afford a Melcher Fordney rifle. And his claim to fame is he made these beautiful guns with a wave pattern uh, in the wood just forward of the lock mortise. And the wrist was uh, uh, skip gap checkered. And in the skip gap, he would either put uh, silver nails, brad nails or brass uh, brad nails, which made for a very beautiful gun. And uh, he met with an unfortunate death. He was murdered by his neighbor uh, because he had taken in a destitute widow and they were living without benefit of marriage. And his neighbor took exception to that and bludgeoned him with an ax. So you have crazy people way back then too. All right. And I'll talk about a few more other gunsmiths uh, that are noted. Now, uh, let's start with the history of these things. And I'm gonna show you an example of an early style gun. All right. Well, thank you for having this small screen here is I can see what I'm doing here. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, this would be considered an early Kentucky rifle. Uh, the butt plate is about two inches wide and it's relatively flat in design. This is a design used between 1750 and 1775. So this is a Berks County, Kentucky rifle. And uh, you can see it's early by its width and its mass. Okay, 1750s. Now this rifle was made in the 1850s. We're talking a century later. Uh, the butt plate here, or the butt stock here is uh, roughly an inch, maybe slightly wider than an inch, and you've got a very heavy crescent uh, butt plate. That is uh, 1850. So I've just covered the architecture of a century of guns right there. Uh, the first one was flintlock, and this one's percussion. Okay. Now, if you were to study the Kentucky rifles, the, the one that you're going to probably see most often is called the Lancaster uh, uh, Kentucky rifle. Now, the Lancaster refers to the township of Lancaster, the county of Lancaster in Pennsylvania. And uh, I would call the Lancaster Kentucky rifle uh, the, the equivalent of the Ford Cobra. It's the most replicated uh, car in, the, in American history, and the Lancaster would be, be the most replicated Kentucky rifle in American history. And I've got a, a daily shooter here that I can show you. Okay, now here's how you'd recognize a uh, Lancaster rifle. I uh, hope you can see that okay. If you look at the screw that holds the hammer to the lock to the top of the butt plate, it's called the heel of the butt plate. From the heel of the butt plate to the toe of the butt plate, and an imaginary line between the toe of the butt plate back up to that same screw, you have an isosceles triangle. If you can mentally picture uh, a triangle out of that butt shape uh, stock, uh, you have a Lancaster rifle in your hands. Okay. Now this one here uh, was made by Tip Curtis about 20 years ago. Um, it's a 50 cal. Uh, it, it balances absolutely beautifully just forward of the lock. Now it's got a 42 inch barrel because, it, because it's swamped. Most of the weight is at the breech, not at the muzzle. And I can hold this gun probably steady for 15 seconds. So it's an excellent shooting gun. Okay, put that one back. We can see the guns really well. Your, your display is really well. I can see it on my end, good. Okay, all right, so... Uh, uh, let me see if I can find another one here that we can have in, in order here. All right, most copied gun would be the Lancaster. Okay. And I already talked about the three gunsmiths that you'd recognize of, as uh, gunsmiths. Okay, now let me start showing you the uh, a, a slow naker rifle here. Now this is a specific gun called a Bedford County, Pennsylvania rifle. And uh, this is called the Bedford County School. Now, the, what happens is you can basically tell where the guns are made by the shape of the stock or the stock shape of the lock. And you cannot tell uh, in this photograph or the camera here, but this has a rat tail uh, flat plate lock and a gooseneck hammer. And what's unique about a Bedford County gun 
is the patch box has a, a, a Q-shaped finial. I, th I think the stock is almost too dark. I don't, I don't think you can see that clearly. What's really noticeable though is the, the drop in the stock. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, the, if you go from the top flat of the barrel to the heel of this, uh, the stock here, it's about a four inch drop. And that is uh, quite unique to Bedford County. Uh, this gun I picked up uh, several years ago at a gun show. It's made by uh, uh, John Sloanacre. His initials are on the top flat of the barrel. And uh, okay, let's leave that one alone. Oh yeah, there you go. Here's what the patch box looks like open. Okay. All right. We can see that one really well, and you could see the indentations. And when you moved it a certain direction, the light would reflect on it. So we got we got a view of that too. Okay, I have now another Bedford County rifle here, and I I I showed this one earlier today. Now this is a gun I made. I want to say back in the late 1970s, and you, uh, here again, it's a replica of the real gun that I just had in my hand. And here again, you can see the huge drop in the stock okay and this is a 45 caliber rifle and i'm on my second barrel on this one but it's a it's a fine shooter at 45 caliber kingston about how much do those guns weigh because they look you move them around like they're pretty light but how much do they weigh is there like a for each make is there a certain weight or length okay. or do they vary yeah, the, 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 I'm going to say, I'm going to, I don't think I've ever weighed one, but I'm going to guess it's somewhere between seven and nine pounds. Okay. Nine pounds is getting to be a little bit on the heavy side. I'm going to go with seven to eight pounds. The Bedford County guns are really petite guns. And that's why I, I kind of like them. They're actually very petite and very beautiful. And the, 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 Bedford County gun I just had in my hands here probably isn't in the six pound range. It'd be like hanging on to a 20 gauge shotgun, something like that. Okay. All right, now uh, this, this, I'm gonna show you another gun here. Now this gun is probably about 20 years old. Uh, this is a North Carolina gun. And I'll, I'll tell you what's unique about North Carolina. The tang, which holds the barrel to the stock goes from the lock all the way down to the wrist to about here. Uh, so basically this tang is so long, it needs two screws. So if you've got a tang with two screws and it's very long, rest assured it is a uh, North Carolina gun. Now this thing has three patch boxes. And now you know how I love patch boxes. I've got one opening here, one opening here, and there's another one on the bottom right here. And all of the uh, cleaning equipment is in this trap door on the bottom here. And so this one is a 40 caliber. And uh, basically I had a very lean financial year in 2010. And I still wanted to continue shooting. So I bought a box of 32 caliber round ball and I shot a box of round ball and a one pound of gunpowder and it probably lasted me an entire year. So that's about as economic as you're gonna be able to shoot, I think. You've mentioned patch boxes a couple of times. Can you tell us what those patch boxes are used for, for people that don't know? Okay, good. Um, here's how you load these goofy things. And here again, if you're, if you stand five foot eight, you're going to have this gun out there somewhere out in front of you. You, uh, you pour a prepared, pre-measured amount of powder down the barrel. Uh, you take a patch. And now the patch acts as like a movable gasket that seals the bullet in the bore of the gun. So it takes up the space between the grooves and the lands of your bore to contact your bullet. And uh, there's a number of ways to do that. You can use, you can use fabric uh, like linen uh, and you can use uh, deer hide, deer skin, uh, anything like that, it will work. And uh, I've, got a, I've got a gun here made by uh, Jacob Ernst, I had this patch box open this morning. Let's see if I can get it open here. Okay. It was a tricky one. All right. No, this isn't it. Where did I do? I know what I did. I had the slow naker gun open. I opened the patch box on that. Okay. Hang on here. 
I'm throwing you off of your agenda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. What the heck did I do there? Aha. I got it. I'll show you. It was the uh, uh, the John Manchester Gorsuch rifle. Uh, this is this rifle here. And I'll open the, the patch box on it. And if you look closely, you can still see the patches inside the patch box. And, and those are little, the original patches, right? Those are the original patches here. And you can see they're, they're not very big and they're folded over and they're probably a hundred years old. Well, as long as I've got this gun in my hands, let's talk about it a little bit. This is an Ohio gun. And what you, what's unique about this is the patch box. And I can see it glistening in the camera there. So I know you're getting a good idea what this thing looks like. It goes from here all the way up to here. And uh, I picked up this gun out of the J.M. Davis Arms Museum in 2019. Now, if you recognize this patch box, you know it's an Ohio gun because this patch box design is unique only to Ohio. And that's how I knew that this gun was made in Ohio. Uh, Mr. Gorsuch actually has a stamp uh, that he stamped the top flat of the barrel, so I know who makes the gun. But there's a number of things going on with this gun besides Ohio. And if I can show this up close to the camera, um, right behind the lock, you're going to find an inlay right about here. It's an acorn. And I'm looking at the same acorn on the other side of the stop. Now, what he's done is he's used a double acorn inlay here to secure the barrel stay, a single acorn here for a decoration, a double acorn stay here before that secures the, again the barrel in the stock, another acorn inlay here for decoration, and the last barrel stay is a set of wings. Now the set of wings here I've learned recently that identifies who the gunsmith is. If you didn't find his signature on the barrel, you would recognize these set of wings to belong to Mr. Gorsuch. Now, when you see acorns on a gun, you have to think the state of Virginia. So what's going on here? I see a uh, Ohio patch box on this gun, but Mr. Gorsuch wants you to know that he is first and foremost a Virginian. And what I think he did as a young man is he traveled to follow where the work was, which took him to Ohio. Now I've had this gun restored last year and every single one of the inlays, including the patch box are made with homemade nails. And here's how you make a nail back in the 1800s. You took a piece of wire, you took a draw file or your pocket knife and you carved a barb or two into the side of it. You cut it to length, you pounded in whatever you needed to pound into the wood and you cut off that uh, top part of the nail that was excess and you hammered the rest of it flat. So what it looks like when you get done is a, like a miniature railroad spike. Uh, you're making your own nails out of wire, if you will. And uh, there's, a, there's a couple more features going on here. Uh, I've got a fake wedge uh, inlay uh, that secures the barrel on the right hand side. But on the left hand side, I recognize they're not inlays or uh, wedges at all, they're pins. Now that was fashionable uh, in the 1840s in the state of North Carolina. So here's my take on this. Uh, Mr. Gorsuch was a proud Virginian. He must have lived near the North Carolina border and he traveled to Ohio looking for work. And that's how this gun came to be. And uh, I did the, the most god awful thing by polishing up this patch box. Um, last week in preparation for this Zoom class. Uh, so basically I polished up this patch box so you could actually see it on camera. And I thought this would take me hours to bring up a luster on this patch box, but it took me less than 10 minutes. And it came up extremely fast. So that might in essence uh, destroy the value of the gun, but give it a couple of years, I think it'll be back where it belongs. Now, uh, you're not going to be able to see this uh, uh, in small camera here, but this is originally a flint lock. Now, the, you, you, the flint lock became uh, out of practice about 1830, uh, depending on where you lived. 
So I've got a very thin butt, butt stock, uh, curved butt plate. I know it's a late gun, but yet why have I got a flint lock converted to percussion on here? And I think what happened is if you're from Virginia, uh, maybe boarding North Carolina, I think you're a country boy and you don't have a whole lot of financial resources, you're going to repurpose whatever you got to build a lock. And so even though this gun has uh, vacant holes here for where the prison springs used to be, this gun has been percussion and always has been percussion. It's kind of a unique lock because uh, you can't see it on camera, but there's a screw here that extends from the base plate of this gun, which actually uh, used to have a, a metal dog that you would flip forward, it would catch the back of the hammer and it would act as a safety. Now we didn't do that in the Americas. So I'm pretty sure this lock originally came off a British gun prior to 1870, that's my guess. And they repurposed it for this gun. So there's a lot going on with this thing, but uh, it, it, uh, it's one of my pride and joy things. And uh, uh, this, it makes for a great uh, story. It's a gorgeous gun. It's beautiful. Well, thank you. There's uh, so much detail to it. Uh, like I said, I, I was worried that I, well, I just wanted to polish up light enough that you could see it on camera. And lo and behold, the thing just brightened up like you won't believe. You could see okay. it. Okay. <laughs> now this gun here took me about uh, 20 years to figure out. Uh, this gun is made by uh, Jacob Decker. I'm sorry. No, uh, Jacob Ernst, I'm sorry, Jacob Ernst. And he is the great, he, was the, he is the grandson of uh, Adam Ernst. Now, let me show you what uh, Jacob Ernst looks like. That is a picture of Jacob Ernst as a senior citizen. We can see it. Okay, good. Now his story reads better than a Hollywood movie story. Uh, script, okay? Uh, his grandfather was a gunsmith, Adam Ernst, lived in South Central uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, one morning, uh, his apprentice said to the other apprentice, look, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I hear some owls hooting out there. Looks like we're going to get rain this afternoon. We're going to have a short work day. And what he didn't realize, that was the call to attack. And uh, an Indian uh, war party had uh, killed both apprentices and uh, Adam Ernst. And they killed Adam Ernst while he was reaching for his Kentucky rifle above the shop door. Uh, they, they killed him and scalped him there uh, in his shop. Now his wife is watching this from the kitchen window in their house. She bars the front door. She takes all of her children, takes them upstairs to the second floor and uh, pushes them out the second floor window. They slide down the, the roof and she tells them to go hide in the woods. And later on, these children would recount that uh, they could see the eyes of the whites of the eyes of the Indians when they ran past them in the woods. Now, when they break down the front door of her house, you have uh, Eve uh, Ernst with her two children in, uh, in the kitchen. Uh, she recognized her husband's scalp on the kitchen table so she takes the scalp and puts it in her apron. Now they don't see her do that. And next thing they know, the scalp is missing. Um, they, they, they determine that she took it and put it in her apron. So they think she's got mystic powers. So they take, two, they take her and her two children and uh, they travel on foot from South Central Pennsylvania to upstate Michigan, Mackinac Island. She spends the next nine years there um, as a prisoner with these Indians. Now, a, a British officer recognizes an Anglo in the Indians and inquires to what's the story there. And he pays her ransom and sets her free. So she walks back from Michigan to Pennsylvania to be reunited with her family nine years later. And she brings two boys back with her. And uh, um, there's not a lot written about Jacob Ernst the gunsmith, and uh, I think that's why it took me so long to figure out why this gun looks the way it does. It's got a 
Q-scroll patch box, which would tell me that it's a Maryland gun, but he worked out of Bedford County, but we don't have the goofy uh, rat tail lock and, and petite hammer, so it doesn't fit. But in essence, uh, it does fit for a Maryland gun. And that supposedly happened depending on who your customers are because they are literally across the state line from one another. And uh, if you look on the cheek piece, I think you can see it there. Uh, there's an eight pointed star on the cheek piece. Again, these are religious people. That is the uh, star of Bethlehem. So basically what these people are saying is when they shoulder their gun, they put their cheek on the, their, your, you put your cheek on the uh, star of Bethlehem and you're basically praying that your, your shot goes straight. That's what that's all about. So this is one of his guns. Like I said, this took me about 20 years to figure this one out. Kingston, is that a double trigger on that one? Yes, most of the guns I've showed you tonight have double triggers. On um, what the purpose behind that is, is the, the front trigger will always set the lock in motion and the back trigger uh, sets it a spring so that uh, what happens is you, you reduce your, your front trigger pull from let's say a two pound pull to maybe a six ounce pull. So basically, if you were shooting targets, you'd want to use the, uh, the set trigger. Um, if it were cold and you couldn't feel your fingers, you would never use the set trigger. You'd have to go with the front trigger. You can shoot the gun both, either way. Oh, yes. Let me, look, let me show you this gun here. This gun here, uh, I have attributed to a fellow by the names of Charles Wood. Now, this is the gun I showed you earlier that's got the... Uh, uh, heavy crescent butt plate. This gun was made in the 1850s. It is unsigned, uh, but the telltale that it's an Ohio gun is the shape of the stock, and it's no longer maple. It's made out of black walnut. So that would be typically of, typical of the 1850s, and because of the shape of the stock, you, you notice there is no isosceles triangle here, so you know it's not a, it's not a Pennsylvania gun, so it's Ohio. And what makes this, it took me hours to figure this guy out, but everything, all the furniture on this gun is made out of coin silver. So it's kind of a brilliant gun to look at. And because it's not signed, I had to find something that looked just like it in my books. And I found it one night at about two o'clock in the morning. The telltale is the, is the trigger guard. It's got a heavy stem here. Uh, it has a long, a uh, sloping curve to, to facilitate two triggers, and it's got a rather unique curl on the bottom of the trigger guard that was only used by a gentleman by the name of Charles, Clark, Charles Wood. Now, this is not your average gun, and I'll show you why. Uh, you can see the percussion lock on the right-hand side of the gun. There's a second percussion lock on the left side of the gun, and this is known as a mule ear. It's also percussion, but instead of slamming uh, left and right, this one slaps from the side. I don't know if you can see that really good. There you go. And if I were to squeeze that trigger, that would fall on, on, on a second chamber on, on one barrel. So this is a one barrel, two chamber gun. So it's quite unique. And uh, you can tell that it takes a little bit of ingenuity to design one set of triggers to operate two locks. That's pretty creative. Okay, that was kind of unique. All right. Now I've saved the best for last. How am I doing? On, how am I doing on time? You're doing good. Everyone seems to still be interested, and I'm interested. So go ahead and finish out what you need to. Okay. This this rifle has got a 42 inch barrel. This was made in 1955. I was barely walking and talking in '55, um, but this is a Lancaster gun. This is an exact replica of a Jacob Ferry rifle. Now, the reason why I know it's an exact replica of a Jacob Ferry rifle is because I saw the original next to this gun when I bought it. Now, this gun was made by a fellow by the name of Norm Marquardt. He was my hunter education instructor when I was nine years old. This is his gun. And it's uh, Jacob Ferry, as I've explained earlier, was a Frenchman, a Huguenot. And if you look at the style of the stock, it has somewhat of a Roman nose here. It doesn't follow the textbook Lancaster straight lines. And I think that's because he brought his 
his idea of French architecture and guns to the United States. So this would be modeled after very, very early uh, Lancaster gun. Uh, and this one is 40 caliber and it's, it, it, shoots, it shoots wonderfully. How's that? Uh, it's got a very elaborate engraved patch box. I don't know if you can see that on camera very well. There you go. And uh, it has silver inlays that hold the barrel to the stock. And there's a total of eight silver inlays on it. I've left them tarnish up a little bit only because I want the gun to look very authentic. And it definitely do, does that. Now this one, I've never really gone into a lot of explanation. This one is flintlock ignition. Some of my guns are percussion. Some of my guns are flintlock. I absolutely enjoy shooting the flintlock more than the percussions. Uh, the percussion guns to me uh, are easy to shoot. It'd be like look, it'd be like shooting a Winchester 30-30. There's not a whole lot of challenge there. But uh, when you shoot a flintlock rifle, you're expecting a few grains of uh, 4F gunpowder to ignite in the pan due to a spark from a rock hitting steel, and that it's and that sets the, the gun in motion. Now, can you picture 200 years ago hunting for your dinner and uh, you fit dew point in the woods, everything's wet. So you've got to keep your flint and your steel dry. You've got to keep your powder in your pan dry because if you don't, you're going home hungry. And that's basically what it was like to hunt uh, two centuries ago. And uh, what happens here is you, when you set this gun in motion, you, you squeeze the trigger, you have a flame of roughly two inches in diameter, about three inches in front of your face. And what you have to do is you have to get past the involuntary reflex to blink when it happens. And that's what makes them unique to shoot. Okay. And uh, like I said, this, is, this one's been my pride and joy. And uh, I've retired this gun. I no longer shoot it. I consider it too valuable to shoot. So I'm open for questions at this point. Okay, I'm looking. I think you were super, super thorough. And I don't know if we have any questions because you were so thorough. <laughs> But what I can do here is I'll go ahead and I'll share that last slide. And can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, if they have, if you know, they have topics that they want us to cover, maybe you, they can give us a topic for you to cover, maybe something more specific with the Kentucky Rifles. They can get a hold of me here, and I encourage everybody to rip out their cell phones and take a picture of it so you don't have to write it down. And then, Kingston, your email address as well. So if anybody has any questions, like me, when you're laying there in the middle of the night and it's like, oh, I should have asked that. <laughs> Then maybe well, we can email. Those, yeah. <laughs> then they can go ahead and email you there. Um, and then also our our friend on here um, can get a hold of you. There's your contact information as well. I'm still not seeing any questions. I think you were thorough enough. So with that, I'll drag it out for a few minutes. But thank you everybody for attending Kingston. I seriously cannot thank you enough for your time, your knowledge, and as always, your 24 years as an instructor. I look forward to many more. <laughs> Did you look that up? No, Did you... I, I didn't. I'm starting to... I, I've lost track, to tell you the truth. Okay, so you're at 24. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll, take, I'll take your word for it. I'll take your word for it. And at 40 years, you get a muzzleloader, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're almost there <laughs> can, I, can i build it can i build it <laughs> oh, you might be able to we'll talk to you then <laughs> well this is you know this is the kind of thing that uh, that hunter education is all about you know uh, it's not just only hunting it's uh making your own rifles shooting antique guns collecting antique guns uh, building decoys i built uh this uh Pennsylvania uh, long hunter knife and I built a pair of them one for myself and one for my brother I'm going to mail his out uh, early next week so you know that's it goes on and on it's a, it's a, it's a continual learning process I, I've never gotten tired of it it is a continual learning process I 
I always deem myself a lifelong learner. And the biggest thing is to advocate for yourself, to collect that knowledge and that information about your tool of choice, you know, know what it is that you're shooting, that you're hunting, that you're, there's so many topics out there that you can continuously educate yourself on. And this is the foundation of it right here, our history. Yeah, and I, th I think the one thing I did, did not uh, uh, he uh, lay heavily on is that all of these original guns that I have, they're 40 caliber or less, which means they're small game guns. Now, after 200 years, that could mean one of two things. One, either they didn't use the small game guns enough and they, they survived after 200 years, or on the other hand, because there was no wildlife conservation there wasn't any big game left to hunt by the 1840s and 1850s. You don't know. Yeah. You don't know. So yeah. that's, that comes to play because there are, there are no hunting regulations and uh, there's no conservation. That's true. It's very true. That's an important part to point out. Yeah. So, I'm not seeing any questions and I think we're right hitting an hour there. Um, so with that being said, again, thank you to the participants. Thank you, Mr. Kingston Wolf. It's always fabulous to see your face and learn something new from you. Otherwise, we will see everybody soon. Have a great rest of your night and thank you for joining us. Good night, Dunder. Okay, I stopped recording. <laughs>